Welcome to Boston Media Theory. My name's Marcus Breen. This is a show where we talk to people who are working in and around media and communication in Boston. Not always theorists, but certainly uh, the show is driven by my interest and our interest in theory and in the kind of work that's being done in universities, research centres and companies that are deeply embedded in, if you like, the, the life of the city, but also in media, in media production and different forms of communication around media. Tonight I'm delighted to welcome a guest from the industry side of the table, uh, Sean Wolf Waters. And welcome, Sean. Thanks, thanks, thanks for being here. Nice to be here. Great. Now you work for PEGA, mm -hmm. uh, so you'll have to tell us P-E-G-A, yep. a little bit about PEGA, and then we'll talk a bit about why it is that uh, you're here tonight. Sounds good. Uh, yeah, PEGA, uh, PEGA Systems. Um, we're headquartered here in, uh, in, the, in the Boston area in Cambridge and um, we are a software company and um, provide software solutions primarily in the sort of people relationship um, space but we have a, a particular platform that we build all of our apps on and all of our customers build on top of as well and that, that's the sort, of, uh, the sort of secret sauce if you will is the platform itself. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you're, you're in what's generally considered the uh, bustling side of the uh, what new media software industry in Kendall Square in That's Cambridge. Right. Yeah, right. it's really, uh, it's amazing to have seen the city change shape in the last, um, well, 10 years, but in the last mm. few years particularly, especially right. in that part of town. Right, yes, it would probably be a very bad Australian kind of joke if I said that we don't normally interview people from Cambridge and Newton. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Uh, but welcome. Thank it's you. great to have you Thank and you. it's good to hear about your company and certainly to hear uh, something of the perspective of what's taking place yeah. uh, in this important space, which is how you and I came to be here together tonight, uh, which is the interesting relationship between software and music right. that you'd mentioned and which I think is a really valuable and exciting field, not only because I used to work around and in music as a journalist and as a researcher, but also many of the people I think who are uh, engaged in media are not only engaged in one form, they're engaged in many forms, right. uh, whether it's production, whether it's consumption, whether it's now what's sometimes be referred to as prosumption yeah. uh, as a producer and a consumer. Mm -hmm. And the, the way that that calculation of changed, has changed has been profound, hasn't it? It really has, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, um, I probably have an interesting take on this because I had a, a long career in music and then um, over time, um, got more and more into the software space. Mm. So while Pega System doesn't really have anything to do with music per se, um, the, 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 my, my belief is that the experience of, of software creation and design is oddly similar in some ways to, um, to music creation and design. Um, and so I think, it's, I think it's an interesting thing. I think in many ways um, what we're seeing with the explosion of software and, and software companies um, especially in the United States, has in some ways um, taken off from where the excitement of music may be diminished. Um, mm -hmm. uh, um, the, that startups in many ways are very similar to um, to, to bands, really. Right. And, yeah. um, so. so, so it's interesting to think of music as being diminished. However, sadly I suppose, so, yeah. yes, sadly so. Yeah. However, I, I, I'm interested in exploring this this uh, relationship and how you see mm -hmm. this connection between, yeah. if you like, the side of the brain that produces music and the side of the brain that produces yeah. software. And yeah. in some ways, I suppose you'd have to say they're both forms of software, or they both really based on yeah. on uh, kind of algorithmic kinds of things. They really are, yeah. They, that's that's partly it. I mean, I think like, in the software business, you know, there's clear sort of delineations between the back end the sort of um, the logic um, layer, if you will, and then the presentation layer. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, my, my role at Pegasystems is um, leading the, the UX group in, in the product, um, which is in some way the, the, the front end, the, the forward facing so um, piece of it. But in music, I think you could sort of make an argument that there's, um, there's kind of a back end, mm -hmm. which is, um, I think, can be your um, your impetus for writing songs. In other words, mm -hmm. what it is that you take in as an artist and uh, then retranslate into song. Mm. The middle 
part of it, the logic piece, if you will, is the song itself. And the presentation is just that. It's the performance. It's the performance yeah. piece of it, which could be a style of, of performing a song um, all the way to what little dance moves you do. Mm -hmm. um, and so um, yeah, I think there's a similarity. Um, there's certainly a similarity in the way that um, the hard, long hours that one puts into it, the sort of art and science of mm -hmm. it right. both. It's very yeah. similar. And, that, and that's probably something to, to reflect on that those of us who say like me have worked in and around liberal arts and humanities for many years and certainly around critical theory have often been told and given the impression that uh, our knowledge and our skills are somewhat less than those in science mm. and that the geeky mathematical people are, are yeah. at the top of the totem pole yeah that's clearly something that you wouldn't necessarily support i gather i don't i don't support it at all in fact I mean, one of the things that attracted me to Pega Systems when I was kind of transitioning from consulting work and whatnot was that, I mean, these were very creative people mm. Um, mm. and were passionate about, you know, what they were doing. And, um, yeah, so there's a, some, sort of a sense of community there that um, was, was strong. Um, and, it, um, yes, I mean, there are, there are geeky people uh, who make software, mm. certainly, mm. but um, there's plenty of geeky people who play music as well. <laughs> so, <laughs> right. Right. Okay, <laughs> so me. Yes, right. Yeah. right. Well, we better, we better uh, nail down uh, precisely, or more precisely, your musical career, yeah. uh, the credentials. You, you weren't just playing the piano accordion in the back no. shed no, of no. your parents' home or anything. No, I, I had, I, I, I was in bands, um, I would say I was in, I like to joke that I lived in a van for about 15 years. Um, various bands. Uh, in the Boston area, I was in a band called Slide, which was, um, you know, popular local sort of indie eclectic rock band that mm -hmm. did quite a bit of touring. And before that, I was in a, a band called Third Estate, which was a big sort of sprawling sort of funk and um, Afro beat band, sort of um, heavily influenced by Fela Kuti and stuff. Mm. Um, and uh, so, yeah, um, and did that very seriously. And uh, recordings and tours and all that kind of stuff right for so, years right mm -hmm. so that's that's something that then you you uh, are claiming has some resonances in software production the, the, it, even down to the lifestyle yeah i, I think so I, th I absolutely absolutely think so i mean uh i mean the, the, maybe the difference is that you don't travel quite as much in, in software <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> that's really the difference right right uh, was one of the one of the points of of discussion in the software industry and I guess where it intersects with design has been the claims that Steve Jobs made quite successfully for design mm -hmm. being at the front end as it were yeah. of as, or what you might have called performance yeah. uh, and to, to see that <coughs> company, to see Apple as a success yeah. would be part of the way that you're describing yeah, this, I'd, wouldn't it? Yeah, absolutely. I think, I mean, Apple uh, clearly has been um, enormously inf influential. Um, uh, I think, um, yeah, I mean, I, I think what, what they did and, and others have done, um, I think Google probably most recently, is, is driven the, the notion that, um, that's, that software is pointless at this point unless it is usable. Right. And, and um, that the expectations for usability um, um, actually grow with with every year. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, you can make an argument that when, as technology is is introduced, we we accept it as simply um, being clumsy because it does something that we weren't able to do. Mm. But very quickly, we expect reliability and usability, and uh, eventually, meaning. It has to have some sort of meaning, mm. or at least convenience, mm. right? Mm. Um, and that's the role of of user experience or UX, which really just means the the perceptions of, of a digital product right oh, okay right. Um, and and so yeah so the the field of UX um, has absolutely exploded I mean um, um, since I sort of just happened to find myself in it I mean mm -hmm. it really didn't didn't exist um, there was sort of like computer human interaction sure. uh, fields and whatnot but um, the UX is really uh, a particular flavor of that and um, it's just exploded as a field mm -hmm. in the last seven years. Right. So you so you help uh, the clients of of Pega 
well, understand actually, the utility of the soft, yeah, software? Yeah, I mean, we, we actually have, I mean, the, what the, our company is set up in such a way that we have a, a UX group that deals specifically with, with customers and their vision of what they're trying to achieve, mm -hmm. because it mm -hmm. is a platform that, we're, that we have, and therefore they can model it into anything they want. Okay. Yeah. Um, my role and my team's role is to, um, for our, our own applications and our own product and the usability of the platform itself. Mm -hmm. So, um, and those are sort of the two distinct UX groups we have in, in, in the company. Um, but, um, I mean, one of the things that drew me to, to this company and this uh, in particular was the fact that this is a platform and therefore um, it's a bit, um, the fact that anybody can build anything is a fascinating design challenge. Mm -hmm. Like how do, you, how do you provide the best experience for that? Mm -hmm. um, and that's basically what we, what we try to do. Right. Do you, do you, going back to the band analogy, try mm -hmm. and put people together with other band members? Is, oh, yeah. that, is that the richest e environment? Yeah, that's, uh, that's, yeah, that's I mean, that's, that's of course what you, in any um, medium to large company, that's what we're trying mm -hmm. to do. You're trying to, um, I mean, I take great pride in the, the people that I've hired. I think they're outstanding, outstanding designers and um, but it takes me sometimes a year to find them. So, really? I mean, yeah, mm. you really have to find mm. the right mm. people. Let's talk a bit more about experience mm. because I, I think it's, it's <coughs> a, a point that's part of a, a larger discussion within the field of media and communication, which we would tend to call affect, right. an affect theory, and the kind of responses that users have to software, mm -hmm. uh, the kind of experiences they have, seem to me to be com increasingly open to manipulation and so that the, the kind of notion of human agency mm -hmm. and independence from software mm -hmm. might become something of a question, certainly it would be a question that I'd want to raise mm -hmm. as a critical scholar yeah. to say, well, you know, is, is this machine overtaking humanity, as it were, at its most uh, banal and, and extreme? It's an interesting question and I, I, I I, there's evidence to the contrary, which is that the machines are being completely taken over by um, human impulse. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. um, so I, what you're seeing, I mean, the field of UX is about um, uh, allowing a machine, a computer, to be manipulated in the most, uh, the easiest possible way mm -hmm. by mm -hmm. a human being so that, um, so that the machine itself becomes as invisible as possible. That's essentially oh, okay. the, what the goal right. of it is. So. Um, so I don't know. I mean, I, I think there's there's a, there's a risk, of course, uh, um, in the machine controlling the individual. But I I also wonder if the other part of it is even mm. maybe scarier, which is what happens when a, ma a machine can act out for a person right. uh, and do anything. So right, very good point. That's very interesting. <laughs> yes, yeah, so it, it raises the question of uh, we we might assume that human human right. beings and human nature are. Right. Uh, inherently good uh, as opposed to evil or as opposed to manipulative or there's there's a lot whatever, of, there's yes. a lot of each um, and, yes. and, um, and 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 you know the, the machines are more powerful but they're increasingly um, part of their power is increasingly the fact that they are easily controlled by anybody mm. Mm. so you don't right. have to be a programmer you don't have to be um, a mathematician you can be anybody mm. um, so, I mean, we, we see this in the news, right? We see uh, terrorist groups tweeting. Um, yeah, sure. That's a very low-level yeah. version yeah. of this, but they're, they're doing digital communication uh, for particular, you know, their, mm. their needs. Mm. Um, yeah. That's something that probably 10 years before they would not have done. That's true. And, and the proliferation of software, of course, means that we have, I'm sure you have a million projects Right. Given given what any anybody can now right. uh, do, uh, this this seems to be the, the the significant contribution that Google made to kind of popularizing the idea that the uh, human machine interface was something that was user friendly and open source, you know, open to manipulation. Yeah, Would that be right? I, I think so. Yeah, I mean, Google's I mean, Google's in the business of collecting information and then they mm -hmm. essentially sell that. Um, oh, okay, right. But um, but. Um, I mean, yeah, I mean, there's, there's, I mean, one of the interesting things is what happens when you bec it becomes easier to create, like, artificial intelligence um, in a, mm -hmm. in a uh, and that's, that's 
fast approaching. So, mm. um, uh, you know, I'm, on some level, I, I think I think like any tool in any machine, there's there's going to be um, there's there's a there's a, an evil side and there's a a, a wonderful liberating sure. democratic side, mm. and um, I, th I think ultimately it's just a, it's about it's up to all of us to sort of dictate what we allow and mm. how we disallow it. Yes. Um, but um, you know, I, I think there's um, there's there's an amazing. I mean, the notion 50 years ago, for instance, of uh, somebody in uh, impoverished uh, um, third world uh, country being able to in their pocket have all the information in the world mm -hmm. is, is amazing. Sure, sure. Um, on the other hand, um, there's you know you could you could certainly sketch out a nightmare scenario where um, mm. all sorts of evil is done with this technology. Sure. It, it has been a very rapid yeah. development. There's no doubt about that. In 1999, I was working on a project in Mexico for the Mexican de uh, government developing their regulatory agency, Cofetel, and at that time there were about 110, 112 million people in Mexico, so it was a population. 10 million people had telephones. Yeah. And that was just 1999, 2000. Yeah. And what, we, what was even more shocking when, when we produced some research was to discover the number of people who had never made a telephone call. Right. right. If you look at the number of people who now own telephones, well, we probably call them smartphones, really, yeah, yeah. or some other kind of device. Yeah. In Mexico, it's about 95% of yeah. the population. Yeah. So in a period of 15 years, people have gone from never having made a telephone call yeah. to, as you say, having pretty well all the information yeah. in the world available at their fingertips. It really is amazing. And mm. many, I mean, you know, you, there's uh, continents. I mean, Africa essentially um, went straight to mobile. That's right, right. leapfrogged it. Yeah. Leapfrogged all yeah. their installed bases, yeah. as it's called, yes. So, so again, the, the, what that means, I think, from, <coughs> you know, from the perspective of what people's ex expectations are. So the mm. expectation now for someone who's you know, seven years old um, in um, uh, Nigeria is that they will always have this ability to communicate with anybody on Earth and will have all the information mm. that's ever been mm. understood to be in their pocket. <laughs> yeah. That's an yeah. amazing thing. It is. And on the other side of it, we have this constant and ongoing discussion in, uh, I suppose it's institutions of higher learning, I'll call them universities, but I think it's also right through mm -hmm. to high school and maybe even lower levels of schooling where uh, software technologies, mostly through laptops or things like what I'm holding now, yeah. uh, make it possible for students to be always on, always engaged. Yeah. And then the, the kind of question of, well, what's the point at which their engagement is uh, what might traditionally be conceived as, l as learning, yeah. you know, education, yeah. and what is it just communicative? And yeah. it's a very, a very tricky space as well. It's a tricky space. And again, I, I, think, I think like in any, in any tool, I mean, I, um, you know, we just have to learn the right balance. Mm -hmm. and I, I think it's such a young industry. I mean, if you think about it, I mean, if, if, you, if you were to compare, say, like the auto industry, which... I mean, there were there were cars of steam vehicles mm. um, before the American Revolution. I mean, mm. and so it you know, um, you think about that the length of time that industry has has taken to sort of get to wherever it is now mm. um, versus versus software, especially yeah. personal software. Right, right. Um, so is, is software really a a kind of language that's become universalized uh, so that it's not you know, music is software, and basically everything mm -hmm. that's manipulable is software. Uh, can you can you run us through some of those kind of challenges? Yeah, I think I mean the way I would see it, uh, there, there's a language. Uh, there's a um, I mean we'd call them in UX we'd call them sort of inter in interactions or, or micro interactions. Mm -hmm. that essentially, become part of your um, they become their body language, but they actually they, there's an expectation of a user to to swipe. Something for, on a mobile device, or to um, or to scroll, uh, mm. etc. Um, and these are expectations that have become part of our language, but they they evolve very quickly. So, mm. um, you know, many of my UX designer colleagues are um, despise the so-called hamburger icon, which is this three lines that represents menu. Oh yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, however, it's become so omnipresent. No one even knows who actually invented it, mm -hmm. but it's so omnipresent that 
at, a, at a certain point, we have to just say, okay, that's now part of our iconography. Mm -hmm. We just mm -hmm. all know what that mm -hmm. means. Mm -hmm. um, so that's an example where we, we are, all of us are sort of iterating um, and learning and iterating and, and learning as we go on these mm -hmm. things. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think, I mean, the, 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 the real innovation right now is actually in the delivery of this to the device. So sort of invisible to the phone. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, that's the, the innovations of the last couple of years. Right. Um, we haven't seen a kind of earth-shattering um, innovation of something like an iPhone in a little while. Mm -hmm. And we will see that again. Right. But in the meantime, we're seeing all the stuff that, that helps us do the things we do every day mm -hmm. on these mm -hmm. devices um, kind of improve in the background. Sure, sure. Um, There's a, a theorist a, at... Uh, City University of New York, whose name is Lev Manovich. You may have heard of him, and his, uh, his theory is that what has happened with software is that the database has become the kind of embodiment of culture, mm -hmm. but it's a resource mm -hmm. that we go to. And what we take out of the database, as it were, which is almost infinite, is a narrative, mm -hmm. a story that we yeah. tell for ourselves and about ourselves. And that it, it seems to me that that connects something somewhat with your idea of the experience that yeah. for each maybe for each individual uh, this is this is a, a moment of empowerment for them or in corporate world it may be something different again. No, I, I think it is, and I think I think the corporate world is is very aware of this, and the ones that will survive and succeed in, in business or in anything are the ones that will understand this the best. Mm -hmm. um, um, understand that we are. In, we are increasingly um, personal with our our information, mm. um, and that's different from what it was before. So, you know, um, or maybe maybe it goes back even to uh, you know when there was nothing but an oral tradition, and we were just sitting there listening to our grandfather, yeah. and that's very personal too. Yeah, yeah. Um, maybe we uh, maybe books kind of um, you know separated us a little bit from that, um, and and there was a library where it was a very um, um, you know, structured and organized and curated mm. um, information, mm. right? This mm. Today is no longer curated, um, maybe well, unfortunately. You can, you can curate your own stuff. You like, curate you, your own, in, exactly. Yes, yes. Exactly. But there's no specialist that you go off to and say... There's none, yeah. Yes, little, you're, yeah. yes. Yeah. In fact, the specialist, the, you know, the newspapers are having a heck of a time just surviving. Mm, that's you true. Know? That's yeah. very true, yeah. In, in terms of... Uh, Think, thinking about your work on a day-to-day -day basis, I mean, how do you, how do you identify what a preferred experience might be uh, when you're thinking yeah, about software? That's, a, that's an excellent question. I mean, the, the, so in my, in my space, in, in the enterprise software, the, part of the reason I was so interested in this was that enterprise software is actually the stuff that makes the world go round. Okay. Um, so there's, a, there's, there's fun apps that do fun things. That's one thing. Mm -hmm. That's a big business. But this, this, is, this business is the stuff that we all engage in, like it or not, mm -hmm. to in our jobs, in our um, you know doing things at banks or um, going to airports or doing anything like sure. this. We're engaging with the software. So the way we measure this, <coughs> UX is really a science um, with a bit of craft and a bit of art attached to it. Mm -hmm. But it's really science. It's a, it's 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 driven by by data. We we um, we observe um, whether or not a an interface is um, useful to do the thing that we expect the user of that interface to want to do. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's the, the key thing is to understand who the user is and what it is that they want to do mm -hmm. and how they want to do it. And then we observe, how about this? How about this? How about right. this? Mm -hmm. and, that's, and that's really what we're, what we're, that's what UX really is. Uh, is, that, is that the fundamental driver of much of, inno of the innovation that's going on in places like Kendall Square and elsewhere? I think so. I mean, I think it's, I think it's the, um, I mean, there, there, there's a lot of things going on in technology, but, um, mm. and, and some of them are actually have very little to do with the experience of it per se. So for instance, in the financial industry, you're about, you're going to hear in the next year something about um, uh, FIN tech or FIN tech or fine tech. Mm which is a, a different way of being able to deal with payments and things that's gonna, that could radically change the, the finance industry. Um, so that's, that has very little to do with the 
interfaces until it actually hits a screen. Mm -hmm. But um, but yeah, I think I think that there continues to be um, enormous amount of focus on usability. On it has to be mm -hmm. a, a product, um, a tool, uh, an application is only good if it is usable, um, even if it's. Um, used by employees who have no choice but to use it. Mm -hmm. uh, the fact is that um, the competition is going to have some other application right, that might be more right. efficient. Yeah, yeah. So. It's not music, is it? It's not <laughs> it's, music. It's not. It's not. Although we're, we're yeah. pretty much out of time, but it's yeah. it, it's fascinating to think that it's not music, but music operates as a yeah. both a, a group, a collective set of experiences or affect as well as a deeply individual I, I, sense of passion. I think so, yeah. yeah and presumably yeah, that's where yeah. software connects with yeah, music. Yeah, I think so, I think so. And, and, and lots of other detailed ways, but, but I think that's the, the primary. Bit, mm -hmm. yeah. So just to finish, we yeah. have, uh, you're still playing music, Yeah. and uh, it's still, does it inform what you do now? Um, you it absolutely does. Um, I mean, um, no, I, I, it's, does it inform the music, or does, it, does my music inform my UX well, work. Well, my, my theory would yeah. be it goes both ways. It goes both ways. It absolutely does. Mm. And and um, you know, working with with a, with a team and continually honing the skills of that sort of interpersonal stuff is yeah, of course. And you know, I mean, nothing is harder to work with than musicians. So <laughs> it is like herding cats. So mm -hmm. working with designers and programmers is, is a piece of cake compared right, to that. Right. Great. <laughs> well, Sean, thank you very much for You're your comments well. and uh, for those insights. It's been terrific. And so that's it for tonight for Boston Media Theory, and thanks to Sean, and uh, thanks for watching, and until next time, we'll see you. Bye.